again to the Rider Review. This is Eric Carrot Rider, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2003 Christmas themed romantic comedy titled Love Actually. Now, Love Actually runs for two hours and 16 minutes long. It is directed by Richard Curtis, who was most famous for his uh, 1994 movie, if you remember this one. Uh, four Weddings and a Funeral. Yes, he was uh, famous for being in the d director of that movie. Uh, the production team was uh, Duncan Kendworthy, Tim Beaven, Eric Fellner, Deborah Hayward, and Eliza Chasson. Okay. Um, the uh, script was written by Richard Curtis. The score was done by Craig Armstrong, the cinematography by Michael Coulter, and the editing was done by Nick Moore, and it definitely had an all-star cast of British comedy actors. Yes, there was a cornucopia of them. I know this kind of seems a bit weird that I'm actually doing a Christmas-themed movie review in July, but hey, it's a hot day, the weather is balmy, I am hot, I am dehydrated, and if you don't like that, screw it. No, 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 I'm just joking, I'm just kidding, just that I'm very, very hot right now. Hey, I have the air conditioner on, but still, I'm hot. So I thought, let's do Christmas in July, shall we? Hey, it's a free country, you only live once. <laughs> okay. Uh, the stars, like I said, it's an all-star mishmash hodgepodge of British and Irish-born comedy actors. Uh, well, actors from Britain and Ireland mostly. Uh, here are the, some of the names. I got the shopping list down. I got Hugh Grant. We got Liam Neeson. We got Colin Firth. We got Laura Linney. Okay, she's American. We have Emma Thompson. God rest his soul. Alan Rickman. Kira Knightley, Martine McKetchen, Bill Nighy, and Mr. Bean himself, Rowan Atkinson, is also uh, joined the party as well. So, uh, due to his stature as the icon for British culture, complete with aristocratic accents and an immaculate view of upper class London, writer director Richard Curtis truly has the substance factor in his favor. However, in this holiday season themed film, Love Actually, he throws all that posh out the window and res in resorts to sentimental gush, saturine music, uh, and indecorous humor. Yes, this might be a holiday themed movie, but it's definitely not for kids. Okay, this is not your Rankin and Bass or Charles Schultz or Jim Davis kitty stuff. This is not what your slapstick comedy stuff that you would see in a John Hughes themed stuff like Home Alone or a Christmas Vacation or, or the Santa Claus type of thing. No, this is actually an adult themed Christmas movie. So be prepared for yourself. There's going to be a lot of swearing. There's going to be a lot of sexual innuendo type jokes and this is definitely truly not exactly what you would call something that you would send your eight or nine year old to just wait till maybe they turn 15 then they could see this movie until then i would not recommend a smaller younger audience age demographic to see this movie because yes there is going to be a lot of lecherous humor delivered in this it's not for the light at heart. I, I'm just telling you in words um, in advance. This is definitely a far cry from four weddings and a funeral. It's great that Richard Curtis called up his partner in crime, Hugh Grant, to be one of the stars in Love Actually. But the problem here is that Hugh Grant has been rendered down to a very small supporting role and is and in the end he just seems kind of virtually lost in the shuffle of all these of all these greatly 
talented uh, actors and actresses in there that I don't even think I would even regard this role to be too much of a support, more like a filler spot. But then again, he's not the only one. I think most of this cast is pretty much filler spot. I don't think there's really any leads. Yes, I know this is one of those movies where there's like a whole bunch of subplots and then they all eventually like just come together near the end. Almost sort of like a soap opera type of theme, like an extended two, uh, two, two hour and 15 minute long soap opera. And then in the end, everybody just sort of reunites and all these subplots that we see featured get all connected into one, into, they all get connected into one big plot, wherever that may be. Because then the focus does not really just concentrate on that, on that climactic final spot. The, the focus ends up being on these all little small little micro subplots that seem to just lead in and out. Okay, so like I said, Hugh Grant has been just been rendered down to a small supporting role and is definitely lost in the crowd to the overstacked ensemble cast. Hugh Grant plays the part of David, who's been a newly elected British Prime Minister. Definitely his comical moments truly usurps the others, the other who's who in this ultra British cast, which includes names like Emma Thompson, Bill, Bill Nighy, and Alan Rickman. In his witty and subtle demeanor, Grant has become a stapled icon in the romantic comedy genre and definitely can generate a lot of humorous moments with, of course, his nervous twitches and, in this instant, the shake of his tush. Yes, that's right, folks. If you want to see you, Grant, shake his tushy to some British songs, because this movie is about as ultra-British as they come, more British than fish and chips and spotted haggis. But still, you know, this is just, you, Grant, actually was the one who provides the most laughs and he actually gets the most out of his character even though his character is on very very limited uh one of the sad weaknesses about having a whole bunch of subplots segue from one to another is the lack of character development but i guess if you could play your role off effectively there's always a good chance that you might just let that slip by However, that is a big if. So a character break into dance has become pretty common in romantic comedies, but Grant conveys a new and eccentric twist to what is an awkward predicament. When he was dancing to the Pointer Sisters song, Jump For My Love, we could see just how embarrassed he is doing it. But... You know, hey, Hugh Grant is a sportsman here. His sportsmanship is something that we can all applaud to. Even through put through some of the worst embarrassing, awkward situations, sometimes I guess it does pay off to laugh at yourself. You know, even if you do the stupidest things that might make you embarrassed at first, sometimes even laughing at yourself could just make you feel... At least a little more relieved. Because let's face it, I'm sure everybody else laughs at themselves. Anyhow, um, with all of these intertwining subplots, the one that's barely given screen time evolves around his character as Prime Minister David as he becomes smitten over his ravishing new assistant named Natalie, played by Martine McKetchen. So the chemistry between this sophisticated prime minister and this slightly lower class help is the one that really sparked my interest the most. I definitely thought Martine McKetchen, who's definitely not a household name like all these other names I mentioned before, she definitely adds an original twist to her character by breaking the cliche of the cute, newsy, novice, in love assistant 
by unceremoniously swearing at her superior. I mean, you think that a personal assistant laughing at, a, at, at, the, at the head of the office, the prime minister, you would think, oh shit, you're, you're practically fucked before you even started. And many people have had that situation. But since, you know, David is a soft, level-headed individual, he let it slide by saying, that's okay, I swear a lot too. So, you know, it just goes to show you that the guy does have humor as his character and even as himself in real life. And, uh, you know, I, I wish that there would have been a little bit more better chemistry between them. But then again, since all these intertwining subplots, I wish there was better chemistry for the rest of the others. Uh, the opening scenes definitely center around uh, the week before the holiday season as the ever-present variation of the mod rock song, Love is All Around, with a hint of holiday cheer is rubbed into our faces. For all those who don't know the song, Love is All Around, well, Love is All Around was a song that was uh, produced in, well, it was released in 1966, 67, by a British group led by Reg Presley. No, he's not related to Elvis. Reg Presley and his British band known as the Trogs. You know, the Trogs, the guys who gave you Wild Thing. Du -du -du. You make my heart sing. You make everything groovy. Come on, come on, wild thing. Yeah, those other guys. Well, in the 1960s, they had a song called Love is All Around, which was definitely more of a ballad. And uh, throughout this whole movie, Love Actually, the song Love is All Around seems to kind of be universal throughout this whole movie. Although instead of this actual Love is All Around song, it is actually just, just uh, you know, touched with a bit of holiday cheer to it. Yes, the British definitely love their pop music, and Curtis is not ashamed to exploit that to us. He did a similar thing with uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral with Bye Bye Baby by the Bay City Rollers. Bye baby, baby, bye bye. I don't know all the words to the song. I'm not going to murder that song. But uh, yeah, it, it seems very common thread that in most British comedies, they're going to be throwing in a lot of. Um, of of that kind of music in there because let's face it British people love their pop music and besides Bye Bye Baby was originally sung by Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons I'm not sure if thanks Diane I'm not sure if it's Originally, Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons, but I do know they got a version of it before the Bay City Rollers did it in uh, 1975. With a myriad of romantic subplots, these definitely could all stretch to half hour segments before we see them one more time. Sadly, not all of them were given enough time, and then there are just some scenes that could have been edited out. And I couldn't really give two shits about. One example of a of a plot that could have just been edited out, and I couldn't have cared one iota. And that was the scenes involving the body doubles John and Judy, played by Martin Freeman and Joanna Page. Um, when they're on camera, they are porn stars and they are doing fake orgies to each other. Remember, this movie is not for kids, I'm telling you. I mean, I wasn't I mean, I wasn't trying to let them down. I mean, there's going to be scenes where you have two actors who are who are who are porn stars and they're and they're 
committing acts of fake orgies to each other. But little do they know that off camera, they actually really are getting it on with each other. But they're afraid to commit to each other and are just too shy to reveal themselves to their, their colleagues for the fear of getting fired. Uh, so that's those scenes was just complete nonsense, and that's those scenes alone could have just been simply taken out, and we couldn't have cared less. The other story that also I didn't care too much for was involving a hopeless romantic named Colin, played by Chris Marshall, who feels that the British girls are not interested in him. So this rich, spoiled kid named Colin decides to hop on a plane, fly to America, and try to get lucky with American girls just by the usage of his own British accent. He thinks that his British accent might be his ticket to score, particularly with the American women. As so once again, to me, this felt like just an overlong Coke commercial. But those were only just two of the subplots that could have been just taken out and nobody would have cared in the least. But most of the stories here do work mostly because of the talent pool and the good vibes it brings to the story. All right, uh, Liam Neeson is definitely uh, wonderful in this movie. No, he's not running away from the mob or anything like that. There's no run all night. This is no uh, taken stuff. No, no. This is no Sindler's List and all. He is actually playing a much more uh, effective character here, a sympathetic character. Uh, he is wonderful in this role as a widowed man named Daniel, whose 11 year old stepson, Sam, played by Thomas Sangster seeks his first crush on an American girl named Joanna, played by Olivia Olsen. You know, just by saying Liam Neeson's character is a widow, just sort of breaks my heart pretty badly just by just saying that alone, because ironically, in reality, Liam Neeson is a widow. Maybe not back in 2003, but, you know, as we speak, he is a widow. I mean, his wife was British actress Natasha Richardson, who who died while going on a ski trip in Quebec. Uh, she crashed into a tree. And, uh, you know, it's just a strange, ironic coincidence that he's playing a widow here while... In real life, he was, he eventually became one. You know, it's just heartbreaking just to even just saying that. Anyhow, yes, that's uh, his character. And of course, he's trying to help his son, you know, try to get the girl, Joanna, to love him back before she heads back to America. She was uh, an exchange student. Uh, even though I thought it was kind of a little awkward for an 11-year-old to get to get his rocks on, still, I actually did feel that Thomas Sangster could be easily forgiven because of the fact that he's got some great comical range, and his acting was actually pretty good. He didn't play off like a precocious... 11 year old he's not an 11 year old talking like a 20 year old he's a kid he seems to be somewhat affectionate towards this girl and he just wants to do anything he can possible to to get her to love him back uh, the comical timing of him is really good although it just kind of felt as if that he's a little too young to get um, to get 
these kind of vibrations. And sometimes I do think that it was a little bit forced. But nonetheless, his comical skills is just like really right up there. Colin Firth. Colin Firth, um, he is definitely not going to, we're not going to go all Bridget Jones, this, Bridget Jones here because Colin Firth and Hugh Grant are hardly in any scenes with each other. So don't worry, there's no feud between Colin Firth, Hugh Grant, and Rennie Zellweger. So I said Zellweger's not even in this movie. Anyhow, uh, he actually turns in a sympathetic role here as a, as a rich guy named Jamie who felt betrayed by his girlfriend played by Sienna Guillory because he caught her because he caught because he, he caught her cheating on him. So he um, retreats to his French cottage and is love struck by his Portuguese maid Aurelia played by Lucia Monez. And even though they can't speak each other's language. The magic definitely comes from the fact that language definitely bears no boundaries. And besides that, sometimes I think people who could speak foreign languages can actually get away with communicating with each other. Do you know that when I was five years old, I didn't really speak very much? Most of my language was pantomiming. You know, like if I wanted something to drink, I would just point at a juice container. If I wanted, if I wanted a chocolate bar, I would just point at the chocolate bar. Or if I wanted to use the bathroom, I would just point to the bathroom. That was my communication mechanism. It's not because I didn't know how to talk. It's because maybe I was just maybe when I was small, I was ashamed of my own voice. But then again, you know, I think some people can communicate without necessarily having to move their mouths. But, you know, here you see a great chemistry between Colin Firth and Lucia Monez, that even though they don't speak the same languages, they actually let the language of love do all the talking for them. Monez definitely embodies a keen sense of intelligence and seductiveness to her characters. And even though these guys are not household names, both Aurelia Moniz and Martin McKetchen are definitely interesting performers and more established here. I mean, Martin McKetchen is not really like a big name out there. Moniz, she's more known for her movies in her respective foreign country. But they actually seem to somewhat outshine some of the more accomplished, established, more public guys in, in, their, in this movie than the next two people who I'm about to mention. Emma Thompson plays the role of a housewife named Karen who believes that her husband, Harry, played by Alan Rickman, is secretly having an affair with his sultry receptionist, Maya, played by Heike Makic. Oh my goodness. You know what kind of saddens me about this movie? Not just because of seeing Alan Rickman, because sadly he passed away in 2016. What really is saddening is that you have two greatly talented performers like Emma Thompson and Alan Rickman Definitely badly going to waste here. And their cliched ways proves the point here. They're just so badly wasted here. The love between each other makes it hard to believe that Harry is a cheater. And when Karen, who is expecting an expensive gift, like a necklace from Harry as a Christmas gift, she ends up getting, well, a not so glamorous present. Yeah, she ends up getting a, a Joni Mitchell CD while his beautiful receptionist gets the big prize. 
That's right. She ends up on the short end of the stick. Sure, we get the music score running with Mitchell's weary version of both sides now. The song was nice, but I definitely felt bad for Karen, and the whole angle just sort of drained out a bit. And besides that, I prefer Judy Collins' version of both sides now. Then next we have uh, Laura Linney. She plays Sarah, who works at Harry's company. And she is somewhat attracted to her co-worker, Carl, played by Rodrigo Santoro. But the relationship is set back due to her mentally ill brother, Michael, played by Michael Fitzgerald. Sure, Curtis likes to include some somber pieces to his agenda, but the things that transpire in the subplot results in strange and jarring moments. So what happens here is she does feel somewhat committed to this character, Carl, but she has a decision to make. Should she spend her life with Carl? Or should she just resort to looking after her mentally ill brother? The end result, which although was selfless, I still felt that it was a bit empty. And I think maybe she could have worked some way around it. But in the end, she decided, I will look after my brother, Michael. Um, and then what seems to be somewhat omnipresent during these whole cycle of things, we have Bill Nye, Nighy. Bill Nighy has some equally comical moments, as you grant. Uh, Bill Nighy plays a character, an aging, has-been rock star, who knows that his best years are behind him. But still, he has some optimism that his awful holiday song might be the key to his comeback and promotes the song at a gala event hosted by Sir Elton John. He didn't actually think that the song was going to be a success. He thought this was going to be a shitty song and that he was only just doing it for, for pleasure. But then it turns out that this holiday theme song based off of an old 1960s trog song with a bit of a holiday cheer to it it turned out to be a success and then he gets a call from sir elton john saying that you should that inviting him for new year's to go to his house and to celebrate now he could have just took this offer i mean when is the next time anybody's ever going to get an offer? Whoever got an offer to go to a New Year's party with a celebrity in the likes of Sir Elton John. Instead, he decides to go to a much subtle route and uh, take him and his partner, Joe, played by Gregor Fisher. They decide to just settle down, go to his place, get drunk, and watch porn. That's basically what Bill Nighy's character does in this movie. He gave up this whole Elton John visitation to just stay at his place, get drunk, and watch Coitus. Yes, the British strive to get a number one single has been a tradition since the 1960s. You got the Beatles to thank for that, but hey, why not? You also got Cliff Richards. You got you got uh, the Shadows, Telestar, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Freddie and the Dreamers, and the rest of those other guys. You got those guys to blame because the British have always been obsessed with having number one chart toppers. And it has been a community feeling in the UK more so than it does in the United States and Canada. Sure, the cost of 
oneness is expensive, especially having to deal with saturated music, which is something that kind of seems to be a bit of a weakness in this movie. I mean, it's fun. I mean, overall, you know, like I said, it was a fun movie to watch. Remember, this is adult themed. I would not recommend the little kiddies to see these, this movie because you're not expecting to see Santa Claus and a ho ho hos. No, no, no. You're not expecting to see, um, you know, lighthearted stuff. This is pretty dark themed for a holiday movie. But then again, do all holiday movies have to necessarily be for kids? No, not necessarily. But it still has a lot of spirit to it. Um, it's th There are a lot of subplots that were very good. Some of them could have been edited out and I would not have cared less. But I think they really overall played very, very effectively. Um, Richard Curtis, who brought you Four Weddings and a Funeral, really brought in the ensemble of talented performers. In it was just too bad that some of them were just badly underused, and a lot of them were underdeveloped. There's a shame that Hugh Grant was not really given as much airtime as we would love to have had him in. It was just a shame that some talented guys like Emma Thompson and Alan Rickman were were very, very badly wasted. Uh, but you know, overall I thought the it was it was interesting. It it held my attention. And I didn't care about the whole jumping from one subplot to another. That didn't bother me too much. But I still think that maybe there was just too many subplots. I mean, there was a lot of laughter, there was a lot of humor, and I had a good time watching it. So it was not a complete waste. So let's go on with the score here. If I was to give this a score out of 10, I would definitely give Love Actually a 7. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember, be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Roadwriter saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.